So the idea of hell developed during this intertestamental period when Israel, they were exiled and they were being brutally oppressed in the most unimaginable ways, like the the empires that were trampling over them were slaughtering their babies in front of their eyes. We, we see this in the Bible and, and they, they just, they were so angry, obviously, and they just said, how can God be good? How can God be just if we don't see this justice? And they wanted revenge. So they imagined the worst punishment possible, the ultimate revenge, which is hell. And that's trauma. Uh, that's, that's trauma seeking to resolve itself by recreating more trauma in the world. Brady. Hey Chuck, what's going on? Hey Brady, how are you? Good. Uh, Woody, Woody um, um, welcome to the studio. <laughs> this is starting off great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're killing it. Um, what? How are we going to start? How are we going to kick off the show today? You had something in mind. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, did you go through a charismatic phase? Um, a, a brief one. Yeah. Tell I me about say, it. What did you do? What, um, what magical powers did you have? I, I, I could for a brief period of time turn bible pages with my mind <laughs> that's the lamest it doesn't lamest it was, it was so it was really practical at the time <laughs> i couldn't figure out i couldn't even turn like you know like a, especially not like a harry potter book if it like a max lucato book i could kind of like get it to move mm, just a the little force bit. was like not as strong yeah it was you know because yeah. it's, it's like pretty unscriptural let's be honest when was your charismatic phase how long um, did that last? I was, it was in high school and it probably if i had to guess it probably lasted about a summer maybe a little bit longer Uh, i started so um i started going to this church um with one of my best friends at the time and uh pretty sure i just met a girl there that i liked and was like i go to this church now (laughs) she's really cute so you were working on a different type of charisma mandy Schilling, if you're out there (laughs) please please email us at info (laughs) at the live after dot org uh yep um so yeah, I was right. I, I liked to, I'll, I'll, I will say this, has nothing to do with, with being charismatic, but I really liked to ride new youth group vibes. Like yes, I was kid. a new, yeah. If you had a good in, if you like knew, if you knew somebody there that was like pretty established, you could join a youth group and be like the really cool kid for like a month, you know, a month and a half probably. Yes. Because you're the, the outsider. But then eventually that new car smell just kind of fades just away. Just wore off, man. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I ended up, at, um, I mean, I went to the church uh, on and off for a while, went to the youth group. Um, I was going to another youth group at the time too, but they didn't interfere with each other. So I went to both. Um, and uh, I remember some really intense, emotionally charged, uh, like worship sessions um, I remember a lot, of, there was like a lot of yelling. There was a lot of like cursing things and blessing things. And like, there was this really strong emphasis on what words you used and like, but I went to a camp with them and that was like where it got real intense, mm-hmm. you know? And I was like, my mom is really charismatic, although she doesn't go to a charismatic church. So the church that my, I grew up in started as a big name it and claim it charismatic you know, uh, people dancing in the aisles type of church. And they decided to dial it back because they were like scaring people off. So they, how did they address that? Was it like a Sunday they morning? Just, they, yeah. The pastor just decided it and that's the direction they went and they lost a huge chunk of the congregation because of it. But then they became like, um, an evangelical mega church. That's like pretty wow. like, it's like a non-offensive mega church, you know, that's just like kind of exists. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's my mom's background. And she really clung to the, even though the church changed, she stayed there and clung to the charismatic beliefs. Right. So she watched, she goes to like, uh, um, Joyce Meyer conferences and stuff like that. She's like really into that. So, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. She watches like Benny Hen on TV and, and like, yeah, just totally into that, into that stuff. Like mm. him knocking people over with his jacket. How cool would that be, man? See, that's what I was trying to do when I was turning Bible pages. I was like, I know if I focus on this enough, <laughs> I can knock people over with my jacket. Absolutely. With my, with my Blink-182 hoodie or whatever <laughs> I had at the time. My first uh, interactions with uh, charismatic uh, 
expressions was in high school. There was a girl that had a huge crush on me and she was just as dogmatic as I was maybe even a little bit more. Ooh. And we were like the most well-known Christians, but she, Oh my goodness. So she always invited me to her youth group and I eventually went, but it was a couple years later when I finally started to like search things out of my own, you know, whenever I hit 19, I took that time where I didn't read any book, but the Bible, cause I wanted to, right, you know, right, and I right. came out of that, you know, a Calvinist, but also in that time, I, uh, was looking more into like the gifts of the spirit. And, right. um, I had a personal prayer language a few times. And then I also had a, uh, a weird dancing thing that I don't talk about too often, uh-huh. but like the uh-huh. times that we would go to, did you um, ever injure yourself? I did not injure myself okay. that I remember. Did you ever injure anyone else or an object? Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> that, that I know of. I wouldn't be surprised. Right, I'm going to ask you that again next week. But I remember like going to the passion conferences with uh, some of our friends and everything. And I would always sit in my own section away from them. So I wouldn't feel weird. Uh, but yeah, it's just right. like, there's some different things that I, you know, I was brought up Southern Baptist, but then the churches I went to after that were a little bit more expressive. And I was kind of one of those who wasn't afraid of sure. doing that, but I never really got into uh, the charismatic movement as, or Pentecostal so or whatever, as much as our guests. I went having. at this, uh, at this conference or this camp that I went to, we like, I mean, like there were people getting like knocked over. Ooh. There was like the, the, the spirit of the Lord blowing over you kind of thing. And somebody would like blow in your face or something, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and you were, there was, there was a moment, a specific moment that I remember where I like went forward because I wanted to speak in tongues because I wanted to be baptized in the Holy spirit, mm-hmm. which is the only way to know in the, in Pentecostalism, that you've which is saved, such bad right? theology, even if it's such a weird belief, right? Ugh, because okay. it's based on that tongues of angels passage where he's probably just being hyperbolic, but we can like read a lot into it if we want to, you know, anyway, so I, this guy like blesses me and I'm supposed to start speaking in tongues, but I'm like, I don't feel like I'm, I'm assuming it's supposed to be compulsive, you know, like involuntary. Mm-hmm. So, I like don't and the guy's like you can start speaking in tongues now and I was like oh okay and then I just started like making noises you know and then I like told my mom that I spoke in tongues and she was like oh cool you know but I was always like I don't know if I I don't think I did you know whatever and then uh and then we like charis I remember charismatically like converting somebody to Christianity and there were like lots of tears and like five people around him like laying hands and like doing like all kinds of weird crazy charismatic shit and he's like i love the laying on of hands when people pray and there's almost like this jedi thing that's supposed to be happening that like uh-huh. the laying on of hands like my sp- but it's really just like a massive amount of sexual tension <laughs> oh you know <laughs> at my church growing up guys were not allowed to pray with girls at the altar uh, but guys right. could pray with guys let me tell you something <laughs> Guess who's gay How'd and that was out for him? secretly enjoying the altar mm-hmm, calls. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's if anybody's listening to this, I'm joking. If you prayed with me when if I was anybody's listening to this, uh, this is secretly Brady's fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're willing to, to break into a church, have you ever been prophesied just over private messages? Um, I, uh, yeah, but it wasn't like a memorable experience, although. Um, I will say there was a, a, a big emphasis on prophecy in this church that I was part of. And there were apostles at this mm-hmm. church that believed, and it was the belief that they got, so it's very culty, right? So they, they got like direct messages from God. Like That's they, healthy. Yeah, no, it's totally fine. <laughs> so sort of whatever they said went, and eventually it caused a schism. The church split into four parts and eventually like totally dis- disassociated with each other because they all their apostles couldn't agree even though they should be in accord right because it's like jesus telling them what to believe so the church like f- uh, the church i'm pretty sure doesn't even exist anymore or if it does it's in some really small capacity but it was incredibly toxic in church environment for sure i was prophesied over twice that i can remember the first one uh were some old neighbors of mine that in a weird way, I think my family actually won them over to Christianity and then they became charismatic on their own. Um, and they prophesied over me, uh, when I was in my early twenties, cause I was having financial problems and they prayed and said that I would never have financial problems again. Can I tell you a secret about that prophecy? It did not come true. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and then, uh, secondly, the last sermon that I ever preached, um, 
I was going through my divorce. It was like, I was asked to, to preach at this ch- little church and it was going to end up being a lot of my friends and people that I knew. And so, um, I felt comfortable opening up to them about how I was kind of like at the end of my road with Christianity. Cause this was the time that I was going through the weird church abuse right, and everything. Right. And, uh, one of the guys prayed over me and uh, said that I have the spirit of a warrior I went through all of this like imagery and everything, which I really appreciated. And I liked what he was doing, but, um, I literally walked out of the faith like a, a couple weeks later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like his hail Mary. He was like Aaron Rodgers against the, is that a football thing? Yeah. Well, um, today's guest, I mean, he was like trying oh. no. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though. Um, uh, speaking of being prophesied over, we have a very interesting guest today who's going to share his story uh, with us and he was prophesied over. That was the uh, connection there. Okay. <laughs> uh, we've got our friend Andrew Josco with us today. And uh, when we get back from the break, we will be speaking with him. Cool. I'll be right back after this. There are estimated to be over 630,000 podcasts in the world today. Many of these podcast hosts, producers, writers, and engineers go unpaid for their work, putting in long hours at regular people jobs in order to make ends meet. This is Bill Barnum, the host of Combine Talk with Bill Barnum. Well, you know, we mostly cover the fundamentals of combine machinery, anything from purchasing to maintenance or repair. Each week, we feature a verbal description of our pimped out combine of the week. You know, with sweet flames or American flags or eagles or something. We have a devout audience of about 300. It's more of a community, really. But in order to keep up with the bills around the house, I have to put in 25 to 30 hours a week at the local Piggly Wiggly. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for what I have, but I'd really like to focus on my passion someday. Most podcast hosts rely on Patreon accounts for income, strain to generate special content to keep up with the demands of their contributing listeners. This is Megan, with an E, a Y, and an H, host of Appropriated Nails on Fleek. So, like, I work so hard, like, every day, scrolling through my IG for, like, hours, finding the best hashtag nail art, hashtag nail art ooh la la, hashtag nail art wow, hashtag nail art swag. I have to search, like, 20 different hashtags, okay? Now I'm saying to get my listeners the content they deserve. And I'm still asking my dad for money, like, twice a week, okay? Now I'm saying... I'm Brady Harden, co-host of The Life After, and I'm here to tell you that for just one or two dollars a month, you can help join the fight against regular people jobs and make it easier for us, your host, to bring you even more of the quality content you love so much. For more information, visit patreon.com slash the life after. That's patreon.com slash the life after and subscribe to donate as little as one or two dollars a month. Make a podcast host dreams come true, because we all need a little second Saturday in our lives. Welcome back to the show. Uh, This is Brady Harden. I'm here with Chuck Parson and our guest. Say hello, Andrew. Hey, everybody. Hey, so where are you calling us from? I'm in San Francisco, California. Exciting. Expensive. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> it is exciting and expensive. Uh, it's been a long journey from uh, where you grew up to to, to San Francisco. That's Chuck's way of saying he doesn't remember where you grew up. <laughs> uh, where'd you start out? I was born and raised in New Jersey. In New Jersey, tell me what it was like growing up. I know that your parents weren't necessarily as much into Christianity as you were be- in the first part, correct? Oh, they were. They were hardcore. So I was born into a Christian family, and my father is a minister. And he started a church right after I was born. So my first experience with Jesus was being prophesied over as, or before I was an infant. Right, Um, sure. In utero, as a a uterus. Okay. As a a uterus? You mean as a fetus? (laughs) It could have been a uterus. (laughs) 
when uh, um i like it where when that happened did you jump from your from your mother's what how does that whenever i was gonna say from her mother's loins but i'm like i don't think that's how that works what was a thing in the uh new testament with jesus and um uh, john the baptist when he was a baby john the baptist leapt for joy in, thank in you his mother's womb that's what i was looking for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not left out of, but anyway. okay pl- please andrew tell us more about your child <laughs> killing it we're killing it all right. all right so i was prophesied about before i was born that i was going to be basically a Christian man of God. It was Luke 1, 55. For everyone who heard about this wondered, what then was this child going to be? And that's a prophecy about John the Baptist, who came uh-huh. to earth to prepare the way for the, sec- for the first coming of Jesus Christ. And I was going to be part of the second coming preparation. Wow, okay. That's, so wow. when I was born, yeah, big stuff. Uh-huh. I was taken straight from the hospital to the church altar to be dedicated to God. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. That's intense, man. So your, your family was pretty charismatic. Is that right? They were. Yeah. So they so started the, in the so Assemblies the end- of God Pentecostal yeah. church. Okay. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Um, so you were, the, the thing about you sort of like being in, in uh, second coming, like prophet of sorts was like pretty pretty tied to that that particular denomination, right? I mean, that's kind of like a charismatic thing is like bringing in the second coming. It's like a really big emphasis. Yeah, totally. That's how the the Pentecostal charismatic movement started. They had this outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, in uh, Azusa Street, California. Yeah, so okay. Kind of- right. Yeah. And this this giant experiential movement of Christianity developed where the, the whole point was this second in filling with the Holy Spirit of God to give you supernatural powers to go out and globe trot and save the world and convert it to Jesus uh, so Jesus could come back and establish his kingdom. So what was your... Uh, so obviously, okay, you're an infant, you're being prophesied over. You're, at what point did you... Um, you personally make a conscious decision to to be a Christian because you were pretty young, right? Yeah, there was no such thing as a conscious decision. Okay. I was always a Christian for as long as I can remember. Sure. There was no reality for me outside of being a Christian. Okay. So it's just naturally a part of who you were and what you were brought up with. Did you have any siblings that were going through the same thing or how did that work for you? Yeah, I have a, a younger sister and an older brother, uh, so they grew up in this church plant that my parents started as well, um, but they never really took the Christian ministry role. Okay. That was that you. was kind of my was, zone. That was your thing. I mean, I was this outgoing, extroverted, used car, car salesman type mm-hmm. person. Perfect. I was like that too, and always having that plan of my entire life was I'm going to the ministry. There was no question about it. So all of my college plans and um, the people that I looked up to, everything went back to that. Uh, Looking up to preachers and missionaries and wanting to be just like them. What kind of people did you look up to when you were a kid? Yeah, I had a very similar experience my church always had tons of missionaries come and visit and bring their stories about how they were changing the world for Jesus and and seeing signs and wonders. So I always wanted to be like these people, uh, and especially these powerful men delivering sermons, counseling people, changing lives. And that was the preaching, too, that this is the best thing you can do with your life. If you're really serious about God, mm. you're going to go out there and save souls, because that's the whole reason we're here. That's the uh, and some game is saving souls and you had so that's a, what i wanted to do and a, i knew i was going to do it as a kid you had a pretty lofty goal right of how many how many souls you wanted to you wanted to have on your uh i don't know what what i was going to say belt, belt notch but that's like kind of sexual so <laughs> it works <laughs> i mean yeah did you have like a number of people you were wanting to save or what was your goal there I was going for a billion. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, it's only one seventh of the people alive. That's not right. That... Right. At the time, it was like a sixth. 
So it was, it was even it was even bigger. <laughs> that seems attainable. <laughs> yeah, right. I appreciate that. Stretch my faith a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but as a five year old kid, I remember sitting in my bed, crying out to God, asking God to use me to save one billion people, mm-hmm. uh, and I was crying for them because I knew they were going to hell. Mm-hmm. Wow. So from a young age, I had this purpose laid on me of saving the world for Jesus while I was growing up and trying to fit in high school and deal with puberty and what all kind of that childhood stuff. is that good god it's, it's, hell was no small business was no small deal for you at that age too like a lot of churches sort of like de-emphasize it so it's a little bit safer but you that was like a reality that was a really present reality for you i, I mean even even the churches that don't emphasize it it's it's a bedrock doctrine right, hell yeah. is a foundational d- part of of judgment in the christian system Uh, pretty much through and through. But yeah, they preached hell all the time. There was an altar call every service where we're asked to search our hearts for sin and and rededicate ourselves to God, because if we walked out the door, we could get hit by a car or, you know, have a heart attack. You never know. You just want to always be extra sure that you're right with God. And we grew up with these plays, Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, that. Very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. So... I mean, this is really sad that people put children through this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is. Just, just these graphic portrayals of the worst form of torture imaginable. Yeah. So that that bedrock of fear was established from an early age, along with my identity and my purpose. It's hard as a kid to try to have fun and to do things that a kid does whenever your mind is thinking about oh my God, if I don't do X, Y, and Z, then people are going to burn in hell. And that was kind of the thing that I noticed growing up that my mind a lot of times was on these very, very serious things and just didn't really have an opportunity to just like chill. To just be a kid, right? To just be a kid. You're like concerned with these massive monumental cosmic issues, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And another thing, like I felt like, whenever I would create something, whether it was writing or any other creative project, it always had to somehow tie back into giving God glory or to tell people how to ask Jesus in their heart or something weird like that. Um, What kind of creative stuff did you do as a kid to kind of like, I don't know, did you like set up like a sermons in your backyard or what, what kind of stuff did you do? You know, I did, I was a child evangelist. Yeah. I remember uh, being in the mall with my father, and we were doing church outreach, oh, and we God. would hand out these things called chick tracks. Yes, oh, boy, yeah. those are yeah, so I fucked up. I would get them with a the, with the little kid's smile and lure him in, and then give him the gospel message and all of that. So I did. The I mean, work. I had fun as a kid, but there was always this pressure to make everything about God, and like you're saying, to be really serious. So like, I was on the playground and distracted by thoughts that you know these kids are going to hell because they don't mm. believe in jesus and i need to save them and you know yeah, that, yeah. that makes it a little harder to have fun and sure just does. relax and be a kid yeah <laughs> i'm facebook friends now with uh, one of the kids i used to witness to on the playgrounds when we were in first grade i remember telling oh, him man. the story of noah's ark and about how he needed to ask jesus in his heart and like even back then like he had atheist parents and so he's like uh no so yeah, we always yeah. got in arguments but him. now i had to go back and i'm like hey brian so uh <laughs> about all that <laughs> yeah yeah so you're right i did the world a favor yesterday i found a track in a bathroom and i i snatched it up and threw it away Amazing. You know. Andrew, have you seen some of those really crazy chick tracks that are just super anti LGBT that are just like creepy World War Two looking propaganda against us gays? Oh yeah. You've been posting some of those. Yes. Oh. Well you're going to bring God's national judgment on America. <laughs> yeah, right. Did you know yeah, that? That's probably Did you the... know that? Yeah. yeah. I've also conjured up a couple hurricanes. Yeah. And you just won't stop being gay. I can't help it. Jesus, man. There are lives at stake. I know. I just don't care anymore. livelihood, houses. You just really don't care, do you? I can't stop it. So, okay, growing up that fundamentalist, how did that kind of interact with growing up? Because you mentioned puberty earlier. What was sexuality like in discovering yourself? Because that stuff can be heavy. I hated sexuality. I hated my sexuality and thought it was a curse from God. And I prayed for God to take away my sexuality. 
Mm. Yeah. Because I was a pretty smart little kid, and I put two and two together and figured, like, I can't have sex until I'm married, and supposedly sex is this really awesome thing, but until then, it could throw me into hell. My right. penis can throw me into hell. Wow. So hmm. it was just a source of torture because I had all these thoughts and I couldn't get rid of them and I was being tempted all the time. So I just was, I just hated sexuality. I thought it was just a, a giant trial and tribulation. Uh, so, and I saw these verses about castration in the Bible and being Ooh. made a eunuch for the kingdom of God. Uh, so I remember having violent intrusive images of that. And I think I was kind of praying it in a way to a psychological castration, just trying wow. to yes. systematically yeah, yeah. repress my sexuality and really annihilate it for the glory of God. Right. And I went to the youth group in high school, which is kind of a the the way that we get students to not have sex, like an anti-sex group. Sure. Right. That's and basically what it is. Yeah. It, it really is. It really is. And so it was really hard during high school because I wanted to fit in really badly. Uh, I wanted friends, but I felt like I had to isolate from them because they could tempt me to mm. go into sex. Mm -hmm. So when I went to college, I chose a Christian college specifically to be saved, to escape from this world of sexual temptation that was right. my peer. Man, I wish I could relate to that way less than I can, but I'm still... I'm still dealing with the effects of like repressing my sexuality for the first, I mean, you could say the first 22, but then I got married and was like repressing it in a different way. So like, you know, 26 ish years of my life where I was like not being, not acknowledging this like essential part of my being for a long time and just having to deal with that. Right. Yeah. I'm going through some of that too. I'm dealing with a lot of anger from it. Uh, one thing that I noticed too is that because I wanted, you know, I'm, I'm gay. And so growing up and having these temptations, just even having that thought, being aware of having that inner voice that even has the suggestion of wanting to be with a guy or whatever was at a lot of points in my life was considered sin um, in my mind. And so I would try to fight against that. And what it's left me with is kind of this attitude of feeling like things can't be fixed because I was, you know, oh, I was yeah. unsuccessful in right. trying to change my sexuality. Yeah. Um, okay. That I just yeah. kind of got used to things not having power and for their. Your, your problems don't have a solution. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it all was based on how much gumption I could have. Yeah. And yeah, when yeah. that wasn't there, then I felt like the weakness was in me, um, not in. The system. The system or yeah, whatever. Teaching. What was some of your experiences with that, Andrew? Well, yeah, and to, to talk about homosexuality, conversion therapy is still being practiced today, which is trying yeah. to change people's sexual orientation. About 77,000 uh, people a year in the U.S. are undergoing this conversion therapy, many of them by licensed professional counselors. Yeah. And teens growing up with extremely religious parents are eight times more likely to commit suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Eight times. Eight times is insane. And it's, it's 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 insane. It it boggles my mind that that statistic is like readily available, and you still cannot convince like even like fairly reasonable religious people that it's inherently harmful to say that someone's sexuality is is inherently. Well, wrong. judge the fruit. You know, if if a system that's supposed to be perfect right, and great. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, too, you know. And and I think this is this is one of the number one reasons people leave religion is because of s sexual repression and sexual self hatred. Oh, absolutely, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It, it's horrendous, and sexuality is part of our core identity. Not only that, it's part of the core fabric of existence itself. Right. I mean, I mean, if we want to call, we can almost call sex God because it's this creative force. Sure. And it's embedded in everything. Everything is having sex. Plants, animals, planets, galaxies, like hmm. I mean the uh, the big bang is kind of like an orgasm. <laughs> I mean, sex <laughs> right, is right, everything. Right. It's it's what makes us alive. It's what makes us human. Uh, so w when you try to repress that, uh, it's like claiming ownership. Yeah over us claiming ownership over your body and it's super destructive i'm glad you're saying that because i know that when i was deconverting uh, uh sex was a really big part of the reason that i was that i was deconverting but i 
I felt weird saying that. Like, I felt like that was a flippant, because of the way I was indoctrinated, mm-hmm. I felt like that was a flippant reason to leave the religion. I felt like that was a shameful reason to leave the religion. It was like, oh, well, you just want to, like, fuck everything with legs and get and get laid and, like, yeah. you know, contract an STD and get some chick mm. pregnant and then, like, come crawling back or something. You know what I mean? It was, like, the narrative that sort of played out. So it, it's, it's, like, really important to validate that, like, sexuality across the board, whether you're gay, straight, or what everything in between is, is a good reason to leave Christianity, right? Yeah. You and and Christianity, it, it claims to be sexual moral. It claim, it makes a claim on sexual immorality. And then it goes and preaches and commits sexual immorality by condemning people for being sexual, Yeah, mm-hmm. by yeah. condemning homosexuals, by saying that sex is wrong, that you're bad for wanting your, your, your animal human instincts and for embracing who you are. I mean, that is immorality. And then it says we have sexual morality. No, it's the script is completely backwards. Right. Especially you mentioned the verses that talked about castrating or, you know, cutting your hand off if it causes you to stumble. That stuff is outrageous. And whenever people are fundamental, like I, I, I see a lot of like you and I being the same when we were kids in the sense that we had kind of this dogmatic personality that we took our beliefs and we truly believed them. So we were acting as if they were true you know we were doing what you would logically be doing if you did have the secrets to the universe and you wanted to save millions of lives of course you'd preach and you'd believe the way that you do but part of that is reading these verses and not it's not always clear of what's supposed to be hyper um hyperbolic and what's supposed to be taken literal and what's like I don't know. There's just so many filters there. So whenever you're reading stuff about castration, um, that is kind of a reality for people like us who took the Bible seriously and yeah. took that literally. Well, and both both the literal and metaphorical uh, ways of interpreting that are pretty traumatic either way. Mm-hmm. So if it's a metaphorical castration, you're to deny your sexuality, systematically repress and shame all of your impulses, and I mean, become a non-sexual being, a... a psychologically sexually castrated being that's mm-hmm. pretty horrendous yeah uh celibacy sexual repression not very spiritual in my opinion not healthy either mm-hmm. and it, uh, and then you have the literal version which people have throughout the centuries they've castrated themselves because of that verse too yeah so crazy mm-hmm. so um so you went to so you decided to go to christian high school in order to stay away in a large part in order to to stay sexually pure um uh so let's talk about the your your christian education experience a little bit um and how that would sort of ultimately uh lead to your deconversion at at some point some years later yeah absolutely so i went to wheaton college Right. Which is an evangelical Christian college. John sort of Piper. Like, if if they had a, if they had an <laughs> Ivy League, Wheaton would be in it, right? Yeah. So I went to Wheaton College to study Bible and ministry, and I loved it while I was there because it did give me that kind of that break from this world of temptation outside of it, and it allowed me to get an education while being in this Christian bubble, while being insulated, and created this safe space. Uh, in my mind for me to explore and learn. So it was during that time that I took a missionary trip to India. And when I was in India, we were undercover missionaries and we were doing relational evangelism, trying to make relationships with Hindu and Muslim, Hindus and Muslims and to try to convert them and their people groups or their ethno-linguistic groups to Jesus. Right. And so I knew in my heart that I was supposed to be a missionary to India. Mm -hmm. I felt that. And I committed myself to that goal from then on. Um, And so I graduated Wheaton College. I ended up joining several charismatic Christian cults. So I kind of got my hand in all kinds of different movements. Uh, The International House of Prayer was one of them. Oh, yeah. We love them on this show. I wish that, yeah, it didn't come up so much. (laughs) Continue, (laughs) sorry. Yeah, they were one of them. I mean, the the Bethel uh-huh. School of Supernatural Ministry, <laughs> That's so just crazy. several several different <laughs> groups, and I ended up taking a ministry position uh, back at my parents' church for a while, and then I went. I ended up going to Princeton Seminary to get my Master of Divinity. Damn. Yeah, so I wanted to learn 
the Bible in Greek and Hebrew and to really get a solid foundation because I was going to go overseas and train leaders and evangelists to go and convert their Hindu and Muslim friends and families. And mm-hmm. I loved preaching and teaching. I was all about the Bible. Uh, so I wanted to get the just the most thorough and rigorous training possible. And it was during my uh, education at Princeton Seminary that I ended up having my rude awakening and transitioning out. Yeah. When, so go ahead. When you were a Christian, like when you were involved in a charismatic movement and everything, did you, is there any kind of experiences or anything that stick out in your minds now that you're not really sure how to define or how to look at now that you've left Christianity? Not really. Hmm. Honestly, not really. Uh, while I was in it, I always had this this kind of nagging question like is this really real or is this my imagination and it was was just this oh it was like even these kind of ecstatic experiences had this dream-like quality to them uh, where where it just felt like this could just be my own mind and there was a lot of emotional hype in it but i just really believed it because the bible said it was true and the people i looked up to said it was true and they had testimonies, they had stories about it being true, and everyone had a story about someone else's story being true. But it was never really something I could just wrap my hands around. I was the and same so way. Looking, hmm. Yeah, looking back, it doesn't feel very real to me. Now I have spiritual experiences that are really real, that they're just unquestionable. Mm-hmm. But that's a different story. Not in charismatic Christianity. It was, right. it was honestly a lot of, a lot of hype. Uh, so when we get back, uh, we are going to talk to Andrew about his deconversion process and how he got involved in the psych- psychology world and, and uh, start, you know, dive into what he's, uh, what he's learned from that and how he it compares it to his experience as a Christian and uh, all kinds of cool insight. Before we do, though, um, I have a prophecy. Yeah? We'll be right back right after this. God, Ooh. That was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> if you were going to die tonight... Do you know where Stop. you Stop. Are- just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> <laughs> the lifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, the lifeafter.org. Heavenly. Welcome back. Andrew, when we left off, you were at Princeton. So, uh, so, uh, tell us about your experience at Princeton and, and what about, uh, that area for your life, uh, led you out of the, out of the faith? So, I mean, I was still on fire for Jesus hardcore during my time at Princeton Yeah, and it wasn't my exposure to more moderate or liberal versions of Christianity that really did it for me. It wasn't the intellectual aspects either. Because even before I'd come to Princeton, I'd been exposed to a lot of different arguments about Christianity, against it. And I had all kinds of ready-made responses and answers. And those were never really the the big issues for me anyway, because I was convinced of it, because I'd experienced it. It was real. So, you know, logic had to fit into that. It all made sense somehow, because we know it's true. We know it's real. We experience it. We have a relationship with God. Sure. Uh, but what did it for me was my i was miserable i was a miserable human being and i had the realization i was an incredibly anxious person Mm -hmm. and for most of my life i thought i had a psychiatric anxiety disorder Mm -hmm. i mean i had i had panic attacks i was just constantly anxious i struggled with looping uh anxious obsessive thinking and depression yeah uh, and, and with the sexual oppression too and so even as I was a kid growing up, and a lot of this was, of course, related to hell, a lot of it was yeah. related to not, not fi- being able to fit in and being afraid that I would, get, I would lose my salvation or, or sure. get pulled into the secular world, or all kinds of issues. So I realized I was just like so miserable, and I was so desperate to get healthy and to be happy. Uh, so I sought out counseling and therapy and psychiatry. And I just finally a light bulb clicked for me one day and I realized something is wrong here. And I think it probably started around sexuality. I started realizing that the Bible 
there were, there was something off there, and also that Christian uh, Princeton Seminary was a more open environment, so people were often comfortable having sex, even though they were Christians. And so I had a little space to explore, but it was mainly my own experience with psychological misery. And I, I made a commitment to myself. I said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get fear out of my life. Mm. I just can't live with this. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was, it was ruining my life experience. And it was from that realization that I began to see that anxiety and mental unwellness mental disorder it was just weaved into the fabric of scripture from beginning to end there are all kinds of teachings and practices that just promoted unhealth mm-hmm. can you think of any off the top of your head that really stick out to you oh a ton of them a and the rest of, of the interview will be Andrew. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. yeah so i had this rude awakening and I never would have imagined in a million years that I would have left Christianity. And everyone was shocked when they heard about it too, because I was that person that you you know is going to be preaching the faith hardcore when everybody else leaves. Right. I was that guy. Mm-hmm. I never expected it. Uh, Same. So it was it was so horrible. It was a but but it just came down to my own happiness and health mm-hmm. ultimately. Hmm. And it, that was a such a difficult couple years of agonizing, questioning, and 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 then drawing back and trying harder because there couldn't be something wrong with the system. And that's one of the ways the system keeps you in. It has so many mechanisms to keep people in is by saying, if anything goes wrong, it's not something wrong with the system. It's something wrong with you and your faith and you need to yes. try harder. Yes. And mm-hmm. so I'd pray harder and I thought I, you know, it was the dark night of the soul oh, or something right. like that, John which Cross. not experiencing God's presence is proof that you are a super Christian. Right. It's proof right, right. of God's presence that you're not experiencing it. Yeah. So that is just a, that's nonsense, but all kinds of things like that uh, kept me in. And then I tried out uh, liberal Christianity because then I figured, you know, maybe it's something with my interpretation of the Bible mm-hmm. or here are these Christians who are still living the faith, but are, aren't getting into some of these extreme abuses. But that didn't work very long for me either, because I realized I had a lot of the same issues. They were in a lot of denial about the Bible and the nature of Scripture and the belief, and it was a, lo- a lot of dishonesty going on, just mm-hmm. kind of saying, well, we don't really struggle with this, and they're still preaching the same textbook. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I ended up, graduating Princeton Seminary with my Master of Divinity, and I was ready to go to India to become part of a church planning team there. I was I was uh, accepted informally, and I just didn't finish the application. Mm. I just couldn't do it, because I realized that I was on my way out, even though I was still in mm. denial about it. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. So I ended up taking a job as a Presbyterian minister in New York City, Okay. and I went on a vacation with an atheist friend who went with me to Princeton Seminary. During the summer to Peru, I met met a lady in the Galapagos Islands. She said, you need to go to Burning Man. And so Uh I went to Burning Man, and then I had this total, right after seminary, I had this total immersion experience. Right, the the opposite of seminary, like the complete (laughs) opposite of seminary. Cinemary. Yeah, right. It's like you could have either gone to a brothel in Thailand or Burning Man. Could have been like the most like di- dichotomy yeah. experience, right? Yeah. So I ended up going back to my job in New York City, and I had all these Burning Man friends. So I was partying with the burners and like, raving and <laughs> and just doing all the, these things. And then I was preaching, and I remember I would like I had all this body pain off, and I would just like throw in a suit over it and get up and preach. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it was yeah. great. It was a perfect double life, uh, which was, you know, like this this little little fantasy, I guess. But but it was symbolic. I was going through this battle on the inside of, of trying to embrace my humanity, trying yeah. to enjoy my life, trying to be happy, trying to be me, uh, and, and then fighting that because I had to please God on the other hand. Hmm. And finally one day I stop battling myself and i just said i can't do this anymore 
And I woke up one day and, and I said, I'm no longer a Christian and I'm not afraid. And I just had mm-hmm. that realization. Mm-hmm. And I just quit my job in a way, whim. And then I was thrown into total chaos. I had this huge total identity crisis uh, and lost what mattered most to me, my dream, which was to be a missionary, my vocation, yes. uh, my way of making money, my friends. I was afraid to to associate with my Christian friends because I thought they might draw me back into the church. Oh, yeah. And uh, so it was just the roughest time of my life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, that was the beginning of my trans. That's when I left, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you were leaving, how did your seminary friends respond to that? They didn't know. Okay. I didn't confide in my church congregation because they were very evangelical. They were very much into it. Maybe sometimes I would have a backwards way of, of posing questions to them. But but they were very much in that framework. I was more comfortable asking questions to my more liberal Christian friends, but they didn't really feel like it was a big deal. They felt like I was more just becoming a healthier person and having a more nuanced view of the faith. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's sort of, um, I honestly, like that was, even though I was saying like, I don't believe anymore, I think a lot of Christians because I was in like kind of a liberal setting, they would try to push that on me like, oh, well, your, your faith is just changing, you know? It's like, no. It's going through changes. It's not. Mm-hmm. I just don't believe this shit anymore, you know? Uh, it's kind of interesting how like people felt the need to justify my deconversion. Um, I think because it probably made them feel insecure because I yeah. was such an important part of like my church community. Same here. I think a lot of people, when I tell my story, I always have to make it clear. Like I didn't leave the faith because I'm gay. You know, it, it's like, there's an assumption that that was there. And whenever I left, I think it really messed with a lot of people and they had to come up with reasons and, that made them people, more comfortable. People say this to me all the time. They'll try to pin it on my negative experience. They'll yes. say, oh, yeah, yes. you are involved in an extreme version of Christianity. We're not extreme. We're the progressive Christians. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and I'm saying, well, look, I'm talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the things that you believe and teach. And th- there are some fundamental issues here, but they try to pass it off on something else and avoid facing the issue, which is a lot of what liberal Christianity does has this double talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's been my experience a little bit with, you know, coming as a gay person, I, I would only worship a deity if he didn't say to commit genocide against my people. And even though he said it once, but didn't really quite mean it that much anymore, still is a little kind of taints my, uh, my my ability to trust someone. Right. Right, right, right. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, recently when we're recording this, we have this issue with Trump where, um, and of course it's probably going to happen five times before this episode comes out, but where, you know, there's these attacks and there's all of this violence violence that's happening but he won't come he won't come out and say that it's wrong right, right, right and so it's kind of like the same things happening with god like how many thousands of years have the lgbt community or other people been abused because of what's said in the bible but yet if he's real um he won't break his silence you know he's not saying anything so I don't know. I feel like uh, when Trump does that, we say that it's wrong and that it's evil that he won't speak out against it. But uh, literally, that's what God has been doing. If liberal Christians are correct and he's real and doesn't really want gay people to be treated sure, poorly sure, yeah. anymore, you know, yeah, yeah. does it isn't consistent. In my, uh, there's in my a, head. an excellent uh, one of our listeners pointed out a website. Uh, I can't think of the name of it, but I'm going to look it up for this episode where they uh, they document which churches have which position on homosexuality and the the lowest rating that they can give is that you don't disclose it on your website so the 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 sort of thing is like it's it's in like progressive christianity it's kind of this deceptive thing where Mm. they might be against it but they're gonna beat around the bush as much as possible until they're like forced to come out and say that they're that they're not uh lgbt affirming they're going to take the next three which, years which to make a decision. Which their LGBT members that they've mm. like sucked into believing that they're safe there, right? Absolutely. So, uh, so it's, it, it will say, it'll rank them on a scale of one to 10 based on, or one to five, I think, based on like their stance on, on LGBT issues. And if they have no stance, they get a one. 
Mm. So it's pretty interesting. That's interesting. Um, anyway, Andrew, there's a pattern that I noticed in your story that we hear a lot. And that is people who leave the faith like we did. It's because they took it seriously and they took it literally that they tried. And the other thing that I noticed out of your story that we hear a lot of is when people try one expression of Christianity and it doesn't quite meet up to their expectations. In other words, when they're claiming that you're going to have supernatural powers, or I come from a Calvinistic background. So, you know, I believed that, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit literally changed us from the inside out and made us more godly if we prayed and read our, read our Bible and all of this. But yeah. when that wasn't happening, I tried to, a different type of denomination. I tried to go a little bit more charismatic. And when that didn't work, I tried a different church. I kept on trying to find where this stuff actually fit between what it was claiming and what reality was. Um, you kind of switched around to a couple different churches trying to find the same thing and never found it either, right? That's correct. And I mean, I, I feel like I had a pretty broad exposure to Christianity. I grew up Pentecostal. I was heavily immersed in all kinds of charismatic traditions. Wheaton College, I was exposed to a broad range of evangelical traditions. And then Princeton Seminary, more liberal progressive Christianity. So everything except Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy and those other kinds. Uh, But I studied the theology as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I did try it out. I tried it out on a practical level and on a theoretical theological level as Mm -hmm. well. And I found the same core issues, though. At the beginning and the end of the day, Christianity is a religion of the book. It's about the Bible. And the Bible is where I found the biggest faults. That's what I always go back to when when I engage with with progressive Christians. It's like, you would not know who Jesus is if you didn't have the Bible. And the Bible is full of all this other crazy shit. So Mm -hmm. however you want to interpret it, like you're still basing your entire... It's based on an impu- on a denial impulse and on a desire to preserve the tradition that was so meaningful to us. Right. I think that's why most people are in liberal Christianity was because they grew up Christian and they it had so much meaning to them and it's so hard to leave all that behind. Absolutely. It's so yeah. hard to say yeah. that this is all you know that this is an oppressive system and you have to get rid of it uh, or you you have to disavow it and, and all that it's meant for you over the years. Uh, so what what people do when they're leaving fundamentalism often is they see these these Christians over here and they say, well, well, we're not opposed to homosexuality. You know, that that's all good. And uh, you're not going, we don't believe in hell. You can drink alcohol. And, and so they say, oh, good, I don't have to leave. I don't have to get rid of the Bible and I can have a more nuanced view, but you still have the same issues that you haven't dealt with, the same core issues, the, the whole framework of, of the idea of, a, of judgment and sin mm-hmm. and, and God, all, all these core issues. And there, there's a, it's a denial phase of coming out. Liberalism is a denial phase of coming out. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I don't yeah. disagree with that. It kind of sounds like saying though, that like all bisexual people are just gay people transitioning and that's not true. Oh yeah. You know well, what I mean? But I, see, I hear is. what you're saying. I yeah, yeah. That's not all it is that, that, that it's that way for a lot of people though. Sure, yeah. Sure, yeah. Okay. That's not all it is. There are other problems with it though. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, we joked about it a little bit ago, but are there in like what from the Bible, do you think were some of the most damaging theological beliefs that you had at that time? Um, for instance, whenever I was, I'm thinking of like, obviously repressing myself of, and my sexuality was really messed up. Another thing though, that I'm looking back at that bothers me is um, this shaming people for wanting a sign for wanting evidence of like, you know, the Bible calls anybody who wants to oh, a, a sure. sign of like, Oh, wicked you're generation. wicked, and, wicked and perverse generation. Yeah. But really uh, the sign is just their, fake news it's how they're define that's how they're redefining <laughs> wanting evidence right, right, right. before they commit their, their entire life to something they want to right so just the fact that the bible like shames people for wanting evidence is bonkers to me and i think that's extremely psychologically damaging what other examples were kind of prevalent in your journey mind control and thought purification Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have That's you a heard of one. this verse? Take thought, take captive every thought and make it obedient to, to Christ. Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every thought. And Jesus teaches, uh, too, that 
where sin comes from the heart that and God says that God searches our hearts to see if there's any offensive way uh, God God turns his all-seeing eye to our hearts and it searches our hearts and minds to render each person according to what their deeds deserve so the God is like this thought police and it, it's it's like there's constant surveillance going mm-hmm. on in our brains mm-hmm. and we're charged with the task of thought purification. Mm-hmm. So it's not just about being good. Uh, it, it's about having perfect, completely conforming, obedient thoughts. Yeah. Every yeah, single yeah. desire and thought has to completely fit the deity's whims. And it's not even about... Uh, being moral like half of god's standards are completely arbitrary they're just there to show that you're an obedient slave if you look at the old testament uh, a lot of the laws like the kosher laws there's they're not based in rhyme or reason half of them are just these are a sign that you're my holy people devoted to me right yeah right, i'm right. i am the lord and i have said so or something mm-hmm. yeah. and jesus takes morality to an absurd level right he, he makes it about perfection yeah. He takes the, the Ten Commandments and raises them to the nth degree. Uh, it's not good enough just to be good. You have to be perfect. Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Yeah. And, and so it makes being a human being impossible. And not only that, it, it makes it horrible just for not being able to be perfect and to do exactly what God says. So right. this results in a whole complex, which we could get into. There's so but, much. I, and I do want to ask you about that. There's so much... Um... Uh, there's so much, the thing about that with me that frustrates me is that there's so much grace and redemption rhetoric surrounding that thought policing and perfection that Mm -hmm. a lot of Christians are in denial about how shameful and guilty they feel most of the time because they're like, well, I don't have guilt because I've been forgiven. Yeah. But like you're constantly overthinking every decision that you make, every thought that you have, every sinful desire that you have is bad. You, you're you're flooded with shame, but you're unaware of it because the rhetoric has has replaced the the whole concept for you. You know what I mean? Grace is the snake oil of salvation. That's a really good phrase. Yeah, keep like going. It. I want to hear this. <laughs> I I mean, it's a it's a complete and total hoax. It really, evangelism is predatory. And I used to be a missionary. Mm -hmm. I went to India five times. I I was on all kinds of missionary trips. I took classes in evangelism and discipleship. Our first task was to identify vulnerabilities in populations and people and saying, how can we prove to them that they're needy, that they're weak, that they're sinful and pathetic? So we're literally trying to create a problem, create a wound, a perception, so we can get the gospel message in there. The first task of evangelism is to make people feel that they're horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To make them not believe in themselves. And then slap them in the face and with so this, love. So this whole grace, this thing about grace being a gift and salvation being a gift, it's not a gift. It's not a gift at all. It's it's a it's a wounding. It's it's an offense to our humanity. So um, so let's. I want to ask you about this particular uh, thing. You you recently wrote a blog post about um, emotional repression, burying emotions. Um, it, that that goes along with this sort of like robbing of humanity you're talking about um that goes along with the thought policing uh tell me tell me what your thoughts on that are Ooh, this is one of my favorite topics good all right so i think that sin is one of the most tragic teachings of christianity Mm -hmm. and i guess this takes us back to trauma can i talk about trauma absolutely uh, that's what this whole show's about i'll allow it I'll it's allow literally it. the whole reason we <laughs> okay. made the show is trauma i'm I'm, yeah. a, I'm gonna take us like like three steps back you start wherever you want to start man this episode is called a traumatic conversation with andrew <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> wow <laughs> <laughs> all right so western religion is can be seen as a traumatic response, as a response to trauma. This is fascinating to me. I'm so excited you're talking about this. So I want to talk a little bit about trauma, what trauma is. Trauma is an event or or something that happens to someone that has a nature of it that it's it's completely horrible. And it's horrible beyond words and beyond understanding. It's just, it, it completely 
blows the mind. Right. And so one of the first pe- questions that people ask when they go through trauma is, how could this happen? Why did this happen to me? Because there's no wrapping your mind around that thing. It's just so violent or or horrible and painful. And uh, what we do, though, is our minds want to understand. We want to try to make sense of it. Uh, so we, it's hard for us to say that this thing just doesn't make sense. Uh, and so what we tend to do is internalize it and say, there's something wrong with me. This is my mm. fault that mm. this thing happened. So often when we talk to people who have been through war and say some guy's in combat and his friend next to him gets hit by a bomb and he survives, what does he often say? He often says, the survivors I, I wish it yeah. happened to me. Why yeah. did I survive? Yeah. He feels guilty about it. Uh, there's something wrong with me. Uh, so when trauma happens, we are, there's a blame game that goes on. We we want to because we want to figure out what's the meaning of this. So putting someone at fault is is a natural way to deal with it. This is why this happened. I did something bad, and what happens is shame. We project blame onto ourselves. We said this this is my fault. I'm bad. This happened because there's something wrong with me, and. So in a lot of ways, Christianity is an attempt to answer the question of why is there suffering and pain in the world? Why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? I I mean, a lot of the Bible tries to answer that question. And what it does is it places the blame on human nature. It ends up saying that all this pain and agony that we see, uh, that we do, that I do, that that happens in the world, all the pain and suffering, all the death, is is because there's something wrong with us as creation. We brought this whole thing on ourselves. We're suffering because we sinned. And not only that, because we're bad. This is all my fault. And that kind of makes some sense. And there's some relief in that. Because now we can understand that this mind-boggling pain and suffering. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what what we've done is is because of this this trauma, this pain that's happening to the whole human race, we've projected blame onto our human nature and and developed an identity of shame, uh, which shame is a reaction to trauma. We feel bad for it, and rage is another reaction. We feel angry about it. Mm-hmm. We want to change it. We feel mm-hmm. we've been wronged. We've been violated by reality. So uh, trauma seeks to resolve itself by reenacting the original trauma. And right, and we'll see right, this right. with people with post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah. What what happens is they're constantly flooded with memories of their traumatic events mm-hmm. and they can't escape them because their mind's always seeking to resolve that original event. And what mm-hmm. they do is they dissociate, uh, they get anxious and, and they avoid being with that emotion and that painful emotion. And so uh, one of the ways that it seeks to resolve itself uh, with Christians is through revenge. It's through hell. Hmm. Hell mm-hmm. is an attempt to to is is revenge. the The idea of judgment is, is making this trauma right. Is righting the hmm. wrong and the pain that's been happening to me. All mm-hmm. this agony gets mm-hmm. into this this gross, cruel form of punishment. And uh, no, I don't want to cut you off, but like uh, this is actually really interesting and. Historically factual, I mean, Christianity arose out of uh, it was a it was a group of people that were um, occupied by a foreign entity, uh, weren't allowed to practice their religion the way they wanted to. Um, they they were dying and losing. The good the bad guys were winning. I mean, this is like the story of the Maccabean period, which is why the Old Testament hardly ever talks about the afterlife, but the New Testament is like obsessed with the afterlife, right? It's because of this. This 200, 300 years of, of trauma, right, that happens. That's right. Two. So the idea of hell developed during this intertestamental period when Israel, what, they were exiled and they were being brutally oppressed in the most unimaginable ways. Like the the empires that were trampling over them were slaughtering their babies in front of their eyes. Yeah. We, we see this in the Bible. And, and they, they just, they were so angry, obviously. And they just said, how can God be good how can God be just if we don't see this justice? And they wanted revenge. So they imagined the worst punishment possible, the ultimate revenge, which is hell. And that's trauma. Uh, that's that's trauma seeking to resolve itself yeah, by yeah, recreating yeah. more trauma in the world. It's and that's a, judgment. 
it's interesting you're saying that because I'm thinking now of what that looks like for us as somebody who was very much involved in evangelicalism and trying to win souls over. That was my goal too. And so what we had to do is convince people, hey, you're deserving of burning in hell. You're deserving of this. But then immediately go to, but you don't have to if you do this. And so people who have the whole well, yeah, we all deserve hell thing. That's only said by people who don't think that they're going to hell. You know, it's, um, they're able to say all this shit that, oh, we, we all deserve this because it's not a danger to who they are anymore. But before what you're saying is that these, it started off as these people were already Christians and then they had to say, oh, I get comfort out of thinking that there's going to be a hell for revenge later on. But where we are now is we have to convince people to become a Christian and then to care about the, you, to care about hell and right. all of those. So well, this idea of like, they're not even starting in that same place. You have to like initiate this whole introduction of making them feel shameful and then giving them a way to get away from that shame. It just seems like a different order than what it started off as. Yes. And here's the other thing, though, with with the trauma seeking to resolve itself is this gets implied on an internal psychological level, not just on a hell judgment level, because we try to resolve this trauma uh, through punishing ourselves, through the confession, through sin and confession, through Mm -hmm. shame. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this is my fault. The reason I'm suffering in my life or the reason my relationship with God isn't good and isn't good is because I'm sinful. I'm bad. This I is why there enough. are problems in the world. because of me. I am the problem. Mm-hmm. My nature is a problem. So sin is soul trauma. It's soul wounding. It's it's identity wounding, identity trauma. It's saying who you are is is bad. It's flawed. It's it's the shame thing at the core. And this is, I think, maybe the worst thing about christianity that it you, the crime here is being human the crime is being born born right you're you're born sinful and our basic nature is 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 rebellious that's that's how the, that's the explanation for why we suffer essentially and uh and really this this idea of sin is also a disease based view of reality, there, sure. there's a disease framework that's going on that we're sick, we're we're fundamentally broken, yeah, and and it's a, it's about fixing something that that that's sick and that's decaying, and and if you have a disease based framework, it's it's based on trauma, and in in order to get over trauma, we have to find our basis on something that's not trauma, something that's entirely different. Hmm. We should probably take a break. Yeah, um, but uh, I like this. I like this train of thought, and I, I like where we're going with it. So we'll be right back after this. We'll all aboard the trauma train. <laughs> back to the life after um i re- before we jump back into this real quick it occurred to me um and i already told this to you guys but over the break i thought it was kind of interesting that and in, given this narrative right where where uh, christianity is is uh, birthed out of uh Ew. trauma Ew. right but what birth yeah birth no, I, i've seen one thing. i've seen one you'd have not no i haven't i mean it's, it's a trauma video. response it's yeah. a response to trauma yeah, birth is no okay. So it's yeah. So it's a uh, so if Christianity is a response to trauma, it's a, it, which was the result of um, of these two like power entities colliding, right? And well, more than two, but it, it, so so Christianity was was born in uh, an era where Jews were repressed by the Roman Empire, right? Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to me that if that's the case. And if it's true that Christianity is a trauma response, which I think is true, um, that the first schism between Peter and Paul was over whether or not Gentiles could receive the gospel, um, which would be basically be saying, like, this system was created so that we could resolve 
the trauma caused by these people that you're now trying to preach the gospel to, mm, right? Yeah. So Peter was saying, no, this is for this is for us, this is for Jews because we've been repressed and this is God's answer to to our oppression. Sorry, I said repression. To our oppression. Um, and Paul was saying like, no, these guys are cool. They can get the gospel. And, and Peter's like, yeah, but you used to like kill people for them, <laughs> you mm. know? So it's like, this is a really interesting dichotomy that sort of speaks to the truth of it being a trauma response. I so, also, I love just, I know I've said this before, but like how long the unity lasted after the, after the day of Pentecost, <laughs> you know, that Peter and Paul, like almost immediately got into this huge argument that was supposed to like, you know, this yeah. huge rip in Christianity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, come on. <laughs> right. If this was and, like, and, yeah, and where's the Holy spirit on and this? And they were come of on. one mind and, and, and one, full accord. One spirit. So, uh, Andrew, welcome uh, back, Andrew. Welcome back, Andrew. So, right. uh, we were, we were going down a really interesting track of, of, uh, associating religion and trauma, um, and I think you were about to you were about to tell us about your your view of sin or well yeah that's kind of a weird way of putting it but the way that now that you're now that you're a psych, a, psych, uh, a psychologist and you have a totally different perspective on this how do you look at sin? All right, so in Christianity we have crimes of emotion and thought, and we're also taught that our hearts are desperately wicked. So we can't trust our desire or our intuition because everything is under this umbrella of sin. And no psychologist would support this explanation of human behavior. It's completely invalidated by every school of yeah, psychology. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the idea that people do bad things because they're rebellious or some part of their nature is wicked or tainted towards evil. It makes no sense of why people do bad or, or unacceptable things. None at all. We do bad things quote unquote bad things uh, generally because of events that have happened to us or mm -hmm. the way we developed in mm -hmm. unhealthy ways, Blood relationships sugar levels. with our, our parents or all kinds of things, but but not because of this this view of our nature. But so when we when the stakes are so high uh, with, with sin, which is judgment of hell or any kind of judgment just for having a thought or desire, this creates a bedrock of anxiety mm. uh, on, an, on a crazy level. And to me, this is worse than hell. Uh, mm. To me, this is worse even than maybe not genocide, but in a way it's more pervasive mm. mm -hmm. uh, because it creates an environment of unsafety. The most unsafe place for a believer to be is his own heart and mind. Yes. My thoughts can, can condemn me, my very thoughts. So what we do there's this psychological mechanism that's created like a third party called God, like a surveillance chip or like a Google search engine. And that's what that is, is really our own minds. We're constantly searching. This anxiety is propelling us to search out bad things and then to punish ourselves for having those bad things. So there's this obsessive, compulsive, anxiety-propelled act of confession that happens. Shit, yes. And this is the basis of, of Christian spiritual practice is, is in a, it's an obsessive compulsive disorder in a way, uh, and an attempt to deal with this unsafe view of the world, that everything's unsafe, uh, and it's a world of anxiety. The, the secular world is rebelling against God, could threaten my salvation. Uh, I mean, my sexuality could, my thoughts can. Um, but so when we, when we have, say, a, a thought that we consider bad, or an emotion that's considered bad, uh, what happens? We we're desperate to escape that mm -hmm. uh, because that endangers us. That jeopardizes our existence. And so the first thing we, we try to do is shove that thought out of our consciousness. And this is where the spiritual disciplines come into play. These obsessive compulsive practices. So we're taught to go if if we have an angry thought or if we worry have these or have these emotional states that are unsanctioned or, or dangerous. Um, we're taught to to confess our sins to God and, and invite God's grace to come in or or to do good works or to read the Bible. Uh, but what those function like a drug or like compulsive hand washing. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. That ritual, that behavior, it only it relieves anxiety but very temporarily. Grace only relieves the anxiety of sin. Uh, for a short amount of time, mm -hmm. and it's, it drives it deeper into our unconscious. It represses that, 
and it'll act itself out in our lives in unhealthy ways and show its ugly head later on because it's not resolving the anxiety. It's just glazing it over. It's just pushing it down. And But then when it comes back up, what are we taught to do? Go back to God, surrender it to God. There's no actual healing going on here. Hmm, There's no yes. actual getting to these core wounds and saying, you know, why, why am I angry? What happened to me? What, instead of being, here's how we heal ourselves emotionally. It, it's through, uh, through awareness with acceptance, mm-hmm. with loving, compassionate awareness with acceptance, mm-hmm. which we could also call self-love. Right. Uh, the opposite of the abusive, punitive way, system that's going on here is self-love, which you don't really hear the Bible talk about. Is, is self-love is and this is the way we treat ptsd and trauma too is is actually instead of shoving these painful experiences away and and avoiding them we sit with them yes we bring compassionate awareness and acceptance mm-hmm. we say i don't like this feeling i don't like this part of myself but i'm gonna love myself anyway i'm gonna be with that painful emotion i'm gonna I'm going to change it because what the body wants to do is it's bringing that trauma to our awareness so we can resolve it. It Hmm. wants it to resolve it. It wants to be reintegrated. But if we keep doing the same addictive drug behavior, it's a drug behavior, this this avoidance, then we're just going to make the problem bigger and bigger and bigger and get caught more and more and more. I've been thinking about that so much lately because I'm finally reading books on uh, mindfulness and trying to get a better practice down. And one thing that really hit me was this idea of just letting some of my thoughts pass by and not really giving that much of a shit about them. Because before I realized that I blew out of proportion whatever thoughts came into my head. And if it was like a temptation or something like that, there was a negative emotion feeling because I was micromanaging my fucking thoughts. And I don't think that our, well, I know this for sure, our ego, our mind is not made to be micromanaged. It sometimes just says really stupid shit and we move on. We count that thought as we listen to it. Is that useful? No, it's not useful. Then disregard it. But having that ability wasn't a thing that we had because you would ask, is that useful? And the answer would be no. And you'd say, then why am I still having this? What did I do wrong? Why am I having you had to thought. search your heart. You search. Had to search your heart. And, and going back to that, yeah. And and fundamentalism criminalizes normal emotional expression. It, oh my I mean, god! It makes, Say that again, it makes please. Things like, it, <laughs> it, it makes things like worry or anger mm. or, or these ne- these undesirable emotional states. It makes them sins or or these kind of emotional zones bordering sin. Like this could throw you into sin, kind mm-hmm, of a thing. Mm-hmm. And so what what we tend to do when we have these these emotion crimes, these crimes of emotion, or, uh, is, is we tend to feel afraid, first of all. So then we have the, another emotional layer on top of that, the emotion of fear. Uh-oh, you know, I might get judged or I'm not doing the right thing. Then we feel guilty about it because it's our fault. We feel bad for doing it. And so we punish ourselves. Mm-hmm. Then we feel shame. Mm-hmm. Why, why do I do this? It's because I'm bad. And then we feel bad about our own uh, lack of ability to obey God. So all so fear, guilt, and shame all happen at the same time on top of the original negative emotional state. And it's just these layers upon layer, and we get anxious about being anxious, and it's the cyclical thing. When in the real, and this is because of the dualism in Christianity, it makes everything out into a vice or a virtue, good or bad, good and evil. And emotions, you know, emotions are aren't good or bad. They're just, they just are. They're mm. an emotional truth reflects something that's real for me, something that's going on, how this lands with me. And so anger and fear aren't bad. In fact, they can be very positive. They can teach me something about myself and how I need to heal. And But it took me a long time after I left Christianity to stop viewing my anger and fear as bad things that Mm -hmm. I had to eliminate. Mm -hmm. It almost kind of creates an autopilot that keeps you numb, that keeps you inside of the religion. It very much does. It it is partly a mechanism and it's partly just a psychological immaturity, an immature uh, view of of psychology within this, within this ancient framework. Uh, So, so it's, it's really all about, I mean, we're taught to bring judgment to an area of our lives where the essence of healing and health is non-judgment. 
Mm-hmm. Wow. It's just the complete, wow. um, it's so backwards, it is bringing loving awareness and self-love. And I mean, we're looking outside of ourselves when we have all the loving power to heal inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it just robs us of, of, our, of our power. Uh, so, Andrew, tell me um, a little bit. This kind of pertains to, you know, the, the topic of trauma. Uh, tell me a little bit about your perception of Yahweh or the, the sort of where, where the, the biblical God came from. All right. Yahwehism. So, the Judeo-Christian Islamic religions came out of a polytheistic framework, Uh, in which there was this god called El, and he ruled over the pantheon. And Yahweh was one of the gods in the pantheon. He was historically probably a god of of metals, of metallurgy, Mm. is the word. Mm. And there's a verse in Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9, it says, When El, or the Most High, gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the people, according to the numbers of Israel, and Yahweh's portion is Jacob. So El gave Yahweh to uh, Israel, to Yahweh, and he gave like these other gods, all these other nations. And Yahweh ended up being used as a war-conquering deity, hmm. as an imperialistic deity. This and is really Israel, Israel turned to monotheism uh, after it was exiled, and they wanted to unite their people and establish a national identity. And so they said, Yahweh is our national god. And mm. what you see happening is, is the destruction of all these other competing cults, of all other deities, and, and they're stamped out. And so Yahweh is, is this war deity. And we see an impulse of imperialism and conquering throughout the whole Bible mm-hmm. from beginning to end, because Yahweh is an autocratic king. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. And w- when people looked to a model of, of God, and a ruler, who did they have? They, they had a king. That yeah. was the ruler of the time. That was the person who provided justice, who gave the people food, who punished their enemies. Uh, but specifically in this context, he was used to establish a national identity and creating a superior race. And at the time, Israel viewed themselves as a superior race. They were God's chosen people, and they were commanded to ethnically cleanse, mm-hmm. to kill all the foreigners among them who weren't worshiping Yahweh, And their vision of humanity was that the kingdom of God would conquer the whole world and people would bring their gifts to Jerusalem as subjects, as vassal states. Mm -hmm. And and we see this at the beginning of the Bible. Um, we, We see that God commands Adam and Eve to rule the earth and dominate it, to subdue nature. Right. Uh, Because he's a king and that's what kings do. And then the kingdom of God is a central theme of the Bible. And at the end, God comes and invade. Jesus comes back and invades the planet, destroys most of it, destroys nature, and establishes his reign by killing all his enemies, putting, putting them in concentration camps, hell, and setting up his kingdom and ruling the hearts and minds of his people forever. He rules the hearts and minds through the Holy Spirit, where ev- literally every single thought is, is made to be obedient. And obedience is the, the foundation of his reign, not right. love. Right. Wow. Fear-based obedience. It's all about being a loyal subject and doing what he wants, doing what the church wants, doing what the Bible says. And this is something that, I mean, you see it hammered throughout the whole point, the obedience of faith. Faith results in obedience, results in good work. This is imperialism. And the Great Commission is about converting all the nations, making them parts of the kingdom. It's an imperialistic message. It's a a master-slave relationship, there's even language in the Bible, Mm -hmm. to this ruler, because the ruler of the time that the model of of this religion was based on was an autocrat. He was a tyrant king. And he was obsessed with his own image. I mean, the whole point of his creation was to flatter himself excessively and puff up his ego. You know, spiritual leaders, enlightened leaders... Don't don't, do don't that. seek worship. <laughs> yeah. They're humble. Yeah. <laughs> Can we yeah. think of any like world leaders now that um are looking for ways to puff themselves up? I'm hard pressed, man. Mm, I can't think of Gee, any. It's I weird that know. evangelicals are so drawn to Donald Trump. I don't because, it doesn't really make sense. And no, it doesn't. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. One thing that's been kicking like 
has been stuck in my mind because I, I heard you talk about this a little bit in a previous podcast. You were on an episode of Voices of Deconstruction, and it really hit me of how much reading the Old Testament does sound like it's based on the same personality type that we have as a president right now. This is we have as Donald Trump that... Um, you know, at the same time, he can say that he's the best for women, but also oppresses them systematically, uh, just as God says that he can, that he is love, but literally created a place for people to be burnt in torment forever and ever and ever and ever. I mean, th- this God acts like an insecure child who's desperate to be lo- to love, mm-hmm. to be mm-hmm. loved. Yeah. And accept because yeah, yeah. that's what narcissism is. It's people who are insecure about themselves, and 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 that's what worship is. It's it's narcissistic. We, we shouldn't worship anyone or anything. And and this so this imperialistic impulse, which was carried out in biblical history through literal war, what happens is when you when you make uh, literal teachings abstract, or you try to make them progressive, or what liberal Christianity does is you take a literal impulse and make it psychological or metaphorical and you take it down to a whole other level. So you'll, I mean, even liberal Christians will kind of say, well, like other religions are good too. And there's this subtle condescension because Mm. their way is the superior way. It's an imperialistic impulse. It stays in there. I mean, like you have human sacrifice at the heart of the religion. Uh, It's, and people make it metaphorical, sure. but it's still endorsing human sacrifice. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, it's like, because this deity accepts human sacrifice. That's mm. wild. Uh, and, and so when, this is what we do when we, when we try to abstract all these, all these things like that. Um, yeah. So this is why viewing the, the psychological and existential effects of this is so important and not just staying on the ground level of, well, it says to do some bad things. It, it really messes with us internally. So, uh, so you consider you, so this is, uh, this is an interesting spot for, for kind of a transition because our, a lot of our listeners are, uh, would not call themselves spiritual people because they associate the idea of spirituality with, uh, you know, you said Western religions or Christianity in particular, um, but you consider yourself a spiritual person, correct? Absolutely, I do. <laughs> so, and 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 a lot of that, uh, from what I've heard you say, is is rooted in a very different understanding of spirituality. It's rooted in a more Eastern understanding of spirituality. You're talking a lot about self love, and I know that that's a big part of that com- self compassion. Um, so can you talk about your, the way that you view and define spirituality and, and how that's helped you in your uh, post-Christian life? Yeah, so I recently said on an interview that I was an atheist, and I kind of regret it because I feel like people are probably going to put me into the, the certain framework now. But I'm, I'm an atheist in the way that I'm an atheist regarding Santa Claus. Like, I don't believe in the existence of Santa Claus, but that doesn't say much else. Sure. And I don't, I don't believe in this idea of a deity who is an outside force who created everything. I think that's been totally invalidated. But I do buy into spirituality, and uh, I think that atheism or pop atheism tends to give a version of spirituality that's like completely devoid of the power of what spirituality is. It just says something like spirituality is this existential idea of you finding your life purpose and meaning. And I think that's not, it's missing the core of it. Okay. Um, And this ties into my story. When I left Christianity, I moved out to California to start all over. Uh And I found myself surrounded by a sea of new age people. <laughs> oh, sure. And I was constantly triggered uh, because I thought initially that all the things they were saying were woo woo or they were just like religion, but in different form, mm-hmm. like in different packaging. And I was constantly triggered and frustrated. And then all of a sudden, or not all of a sudden, I had what could be described of as a spiritual awakening in that, in that movement. Um, and part, this was partly through, through psychedelics, uh, yeah. or in, theog- in theogenic substances, um, specifically psilocybin mushrooms sure. is that taking these, I was confronted with an entirely different experience of reality. Mm-hmm. 
a whole new new modes of perception and existence and it completely blew my worldview out of the water uh, and changed my life and i started learning things like meditation uh, transpersonal psychology buddhist psychology even hindu principles and that's how i healed mm -hmm. it was through mm -hmm. eastern spirituality and eastern thought it was, it was primarily through that and through a therapist who is trained in these modalities and ways of thinking. And what I discovered was that my atheism, the atheism I had bought into, was, was in some ways just as dogmatic as the Christianity I'd came out of. And it had, put, it had labeled this Eastern spirituality under the same grouping as, as religion and said, this doesn't fit. We, we don't buy it because we can't put our empirical measurements around it in the way we'd like to, to be comfortable with it. And it smells too much like religion. Mm -hmm. um, when in reality, there's thousands of years of, of people observing different states of consciousness, thousands of years and cataloging these experiences and, and peering into these realities. And these are being reproduced in scientific experiment after scientific experiment. Yeah. And, and these things are crazy, by the way. Like, I feel like I'm, I, I'm crazy for saying that, entertaining these things. I wouldn't blame anyone for dismissing me, sure. except that there are millions of people, si serious sciencey people, who are saying the same things uh, and able to reproduce these kinds of experiences through psychedelics or meditation. Um, and, and things like, for instance, uh, spirituality, we can talk about something like, uh, what is it, leaving your body, astral travel, mm -hmm. right? This is a reproducible phenomena. It, it happens all the time, and it can be induced reliably and consistently through, say, 5-MeO-DMT or a non-dual experience, experiencing your consciousness expand and the dissolving of your ego like in death and like you are, are, are one with all of reality. Sure. These kinds of experiences are reproduced reliably all the time. Uh, and things like communicating with these things that seem to be like deities mm -hmm. uh, on, on psychedelics and uh, all kinds of shamanic experiences. So my point is, the typical atheist response to this is to say, well, this is all in your head. And what does that mean? You've just dismissed the whole thing and said absolutely nothing. Right. And you haven't considered anything and dogmatically dismissed it because it doesn't fit into your worldview and you're uncomfortable with it. Uh, but, but I mean, that doesn't actually say anything. And, and I'm not saying we have to conclude that these things actually are gods or, or make any conclusion, but to just, all that does is, is just dismiss what's going on sure. and, and the evidence. But spirituality, in my view, is about experience. It's radically experientially oriented. Mm -hmm. And so part of it kind of defies this desire to control through categorization hmm. uh, it, be, because it, it it, the whole point of it is that it's an experience, um, but that doesn't mean it can't be understood. I, I view, um, I guess, to what spirituality actually is. Uh, the fundamental reality of it is it, people will throw words like non-duality or oneness around. Sure. And the idea that everything is connected, all of reality is is one connected whole, and uh there's an idea of, of duality or separation, like I'm separate from you. Uh, you know, this rock is separate from me. But at a fundamental level, this all breaks down and everything is connected uh, on a mm -hmm. physical level. And, um, and everything is alive, too. Like the universe functions like an organism. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this idea of oneness and non-duality means that uh, brings a sense of of connection and connectedness. And I think that's at the heart of spirituality, is that if I'm connected to everything, and, and I experience that, this isn't just a teaching, if I have these experiences of of being, of, of inhabiting, this, this might sound crazy, the body of a tree, or, sure. or a rock, or my consciousness expanding, um, I realize that I'm a part of nature, uh, mm -hmm. and that nature is everything. And uh, it's hard for me to hate what's a part of me. It's hard for me to destroy and dominate what's a part of me. Sure. So f love is a function of oneness. And when I understand that there's this higher harmony going on, uh, 
it, it's things like competition and domination and oppression start to make less sense. Mm-hmm. So, As, it, so it's, it sounds like the psychedelics are scientifically affecting your brain's uh, function of an ego is basically what you're saying, right? Is that it's taking away scientifically when you ingest these, uh, these mushrooms and other things that it is causing your brain to kind of like melt that part away that cares only about itself and is opening is up aware to awareness of itself. Yeah. And is that, that's also would be kind of t- attached to those out of body experiences from some of the things that I've read as well. Um, scientifically what's kind of going on there, Andrew, from your knowledge. Yeah, there's a lot. And and I'm part of this whole community. I'm constantly going to events and conferences and reading books on this. And there are a lot of heavy academic heavyweights who are experiencing this. And actually, the focus of my school, California Institute of Integral Studies, is bridging East and West and this mm. science and what's called spirituality together. Uh, and, and so, yeah, these, these, uh, these consciousness expanders uh, kind of the theory is they they shut down what's called the default mode network, mm-hmm. which is this uh, this part of the brain that kind of relates to ego functioning and allow hyperwires other parts of the brain and allows different kinds of connections and things to happen. But that doesn't necessarily explain what's going on. Just to say we see this happening in the brain, you know, that doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. tell us sure. uh, much more than that. But the interesting thing to all this is that. Religion is based on, or Western religion is based on dualism mm-hmm. or separation based thinking. Sure. Uh, it, it, which is kind of the opposite of what I see as spirituality. Right. Uh, right is right. dualism. And we have this division that atheism preserves this division between spirit and matter. Uh, and actually, a lot of atheism's problem is that it maintains the same categories it inherited from religion. Oh, sure. uh, which is yeah. a dualistic view of the world, uh, a separation-based view of the world. So in religion, we have matter and spirit. We have super nature. This is better than nature because it's a part of God. God created it. And what's what's of God is superior and holy and lasts forever. Mm-hmm. And kind of the earth things are inferior. You know, sex is an earth thing. Pleasure is an earth thing. Those are things we deny for the spirit things. And, the flesh. And, yeah, and the two never really mix spirit and, and matter. That's religion and science. They're two different realms. Well, those are outdated. So even the term spirituality is a dated term because there's no such division of reality. It's just different ways that we perceive or experience it. So what what people what I might call spiritual, it's not really separate from material. It's just a different way of approaching it or experience it, or or maybe there's a way that. I, I, I'm convinced it all makes sense scientifically. Like there can't be a contradiction because it's one, it's one unified whole. Sure. Um, but with this, this dualistic worldview uh, results in humanity warring against nature. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it results in um, a dominator approach, a domineering approach to life in the universe. Mm-hmm. And we see the universe as a hostile place mm-hmm. in which we're fighting against death. Right. And and so when we come at often atheism ends up being this very isolated, terrifying view of the universe. Yeah. Now I don't have God and I'm just going to die and I'm living in a hostile, disconnected world. And I just have to kind of make the basis, the best of it with my rationality. Well, that's no spirituality. Right. And it's not even an accurate view of reality mm-hmm. uh, either. Like death is is natural. Death is 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 not a bad thing. Right. Uh, All right. I mean, there's there's so much here that. <laughs> well, it, you know, what, um, let me, we're we're probably gonna wrap up here soon, but I do want to ask you one more question. So, um, how does um, so you've you've sort of explained very very well actually how um, like this sort of oneness, the spiritual view of the universe um, can can unify us with with the earth and with other people and sort of like uh, steer us away from from you know different kinds of warring that we participate in um how how has that affected your perception of yourself self-compassion self-love great question so it's given me a sense of aliveness which i think is the key to overcoming trauma too Mm. is viewing our is is connecting with life and which has nothing to do with trauma 
-hmm. And that's why it's curative to trauma. Because if we're always approaching healing from the perspective of trauma, we're being stuck in that kind of disease mindset. Sure. Um, but, but understanding that I'm connected to everything and really experiencing that, not just on an intellectual level, but in, in just mind-blowing ways that um, I'm not aloneness doesn't really make sense to me anymore mm -hmm. isolation doesn't make sense to me anymore sure. uh love makes sense to me on a foundational uh, level um accepting all of reality the good and the bad mm -hmm. and uh and not having to judge it this is sinful this is right this is mm -hmm. wrong shit well andrew this has been a trip and i pun intended <laughs> uh this is great this is a really good interview are you good, Brady? That was you a just... horrible joke. I'm just really pissed off about how bad that joke was. You're just pissed that you didn't think of it. Ah, uh, okay, you're probably right. Uh, <laughs> dude, thank you so much. Um, is there? Uh, can you tell us about your blog um, and anything else you want people to know about out there? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a blog called Life After Dogma. It's lifeafterdogma.org. And really just in like March, I started blogging and I couldn't stop. I, I have a couple hundred pages of I articles. Was, I, I mean, I can't recommend this, this blog enough. It's really, it's really interesting content for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, psychology, whether you want to think about psychology, psychedelics, spirituality, sexuality, there's, there's a lot of good, really good entries on there. Yeah. So this, I'm just, I love doing this. I'm, I'm inspired and like, I want to do more of it. I'm giving a, another talk called Reclaiming Sexuality from Religion cool. here in San Francisco uh, in about a month awesome. as well, December 6th. Uh, so I'm I'm always looking to, to give more talks and just because I'm just having fun. Good. Awesome. <laughs> I like that. And you uh, you are a practicing clinical psychologist. Is that correct? I'm I'm in school. I'm okay. working on my doctorate. So I'm not. Uh, okay. I do. I do coaching, and I have my master of divinity. Okay. Uh, but I'm not. And and I, I I also would like to say that what I'm about is is freedom. I want people to flourish mm -hmm. and to to be their best selves. And it's hard to be free in in this kind of a framework. Yes. Uh, and yeah. so th th that's the heart of it is is getting to the to spirituality and getting to be able to ask these qu these basic questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Dude, thank that. you so much. Yeah, thank you that so is a, much. That's a, such good a good God. message uh, to end on, and thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm Chuck Parson. And I'm Brady Harden. And, and this has been... The Life the After. The Life After. <laughs> and don't forget, if you don't go to church... Sunday is just, just a, a second, second Saturday. Saturday. <laughs>